opportunity. Uh, I'm John Hayden, uh, Director of uh, Storage at EBS. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of EBS's role in cloud modernization and, and kind of modernizing data storage from an EBS perspective. Now, the first thing that every customer says um, when they're talking about their journey to the cloud is very much that they want to move faster. Uh, and so absolutely bar none, agility and the speed of innovation is the thing that's absolutely driving the movement to the cloud. Now, everybody's cloud evolution kind of comes in different flavors, depending on where you are on that path. Sometimes that is migrating to the cloud via lift and shift, right? The three horsemen of uh, 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 the modern IT infrastructure, storage, network, and compute. How can I go and sub those in in a cloud-based architecture and go forward moving my, my applications from on-prem uh, to the cloud? The second big evolution is when people say, hey, you know what? I really want to embrace some of the services that the cloud provides, and I want to, for instance, adopt serverless, or I want to replatform using some managed services. Um, the third is kind of in concert with that modernization, which is, hey, how am I going to go optimize my applications for uh, uh, use in the cloud? And the second thing that comes along with that is cost savings, right? So first is absolutely agility, but the second is cost savings. And where on that cost savings journey you are um, is very much related to where you are on that evolution. Um, whether or not it is a straight up lift and shift, which we still see advantages in terms of cost, all the way through the replatforming, all the way through uh, the kind of optimization that would happen after that. But what's EBS's role in kind of that whole evolution for our customers moving to the cloud? And I thought that being a technical discussion, it would probably be make sure that we're all working from kind of the same basic foundational premise around things like EBS. And so maybe just a little brief recourse in terms of what is EBS. EBS, in its simplest form, is network attached block storage, right? It's disaggregated from the instance, which means it has a life cycle that is, is different than the instance. It can be attached to an instance, and we'll go into this in a bit more detail later in the presentation, but it is also uh, a zonal service. It's one of the few services in AWS that is zonal and not regional. EC2 is another zonal service that you'd be familiar with. We're going to talk about that from a fault resiliency and a fault domain perspective a little bit later. But you can think about this as network attached device storages or network attached block storage. Um, and it's presented uh, via a standard NVMe interface uh, directly on the instance. And you can use this, of course, for boot. In fact, all instances in AWS boot off of uh, EBS, but you can also use it uh, for data volumes for your database or for your application, et cetera. Now, compare and contrast this with something like uh, instance-based storage or ephemeral storage. Instance-based storage or ephemeral storage, the one thing to remember is this tied to the life cycle of the, uh, of the instance. So when you stop that instance, the ephemeral storage is effectively zeroed, right? Um, and prepared for the next person who may be using that piece of infrastructure in our, in our architecture. So the big difference between ephemeral storage and EBS storage is whether or not it is attached to the instance lifecycle and it lives on its own or whether or not it's part of the instance itself. And we'll talk about some of the services associated with EBS as well. But if we were to talk about what defines EBS, uh, we'd talk in a couple of different formats. We'd talk about, hey, it's super scalable um, uh, in that uh, creating an EBS uh, uh, volume, and in fact, an EBS volume with data in it, because we'll talk about the snapshot integration, is O of seconds. Um, uh, you can have an EBS snapshot that uh, is stored in S3, and as you launch that EBS volume, uh, we will dynamically bring that data from S3 into the EBS context, so all the LBAs of that particular block device from that snapshot are populated real time uh, on demand as well as cursored behind the scenes, bringing it online. So you can instance a zero byte contained volume or a petabyte worth of data directly from S3 in O of seconds. You can also virtually unlimitedly scale this depending on what your workload is, 
right? So if you need to vertically scale either data in place because you're pulling it from snapshots or you need to uh, horizontally scale because you're creating many more instances of what you're running, you can kind of do that dynamically. It's also super simple and easy to manage uh, in that it, it is uh, providing multiple different storage types. And we'll go through those from a uh, ops and from a bandwidth and from a performance perspective. And you can dynamically move amongst those as you might want to in a completely online and real-time way. So you could have, for instance, a lower performance volume serving I.O. for your application. as You're a single API call away without quiescing the application, without quiescing the actual workload from moving that to a different performance profile, a different capacity, or an entirely different volume type. And it's also optimized. Um, you know, since it is really by the drip, you're consuming it by the drip, uh, and all the services are associated with uh, just it being a EBS volume type, you don't have to worry about having to move from one infrastructure to another infrastructure, moving from one type of an instance to another type of instance, since it's disaggregated from the instance is as simple as unmounting it from one instance and, and reattaching it to another instance. Now, as I said, you can beset this in an overall block storage portfolio, right? You have instance store on one side, which is attached to the instance lifecycle. You have EBS, which has multiple different volume types. And then there's a whole set of data services and backup services that EBS also supports that we'll go into in some other presentations here, but we'll touch on briefly uh, around snapshot services and those types of things. But if we dive into the speeds and feeds and we talk about the actual volume types themselves, they range in uh, uh, scale from general purpose volumes, which 80% uh, uh, of the usage is probably generally purpose volumes, right? GP2, GP3. GP3 is a, a much more nimble, much more right-sized and cheaper alternative to GP2. GP2 was our original general purpose offering offered about 10 years ago. We brought out GP3 about three years ago. We also released IO2, which you can think about as our enterprise volume type. And it's also capable of providing sub millisecond sustained IO. And so you can think about this as perfect for some of those lift and shift opportunities, um, specifically for very demanding workloads, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's very common to see typical 300, 400 microsecond sustained latency and very tight tail latency control on IO2 and IO2BX. You can see that IO2 has evolved into IO2BX. IO2BX is supported on many of our instances today and will continue to expand that support over time. ST1 and SC1 are really driven towards kind of a bandwidth uh, and a lower performance, kind of an archive tier, uh, depending streaming to archive. ST1 is more streaming workloads. SC1 is more of an archive workload, and they all span the gamut in terms of cost against that performance so that you can right size the performance needs to the cost needs to the size needs, but there aren't very many one-way doors here. In fact, there aren't any one-way doors on this slide, meaning that you can move from any one of these volume types to any one of the other volume types with a single API call, all still running the workload that was running on that instance. Are those uh, throttled um, max speeds or? Those are not throttled max speeds. So this is, when we talk about max IOPS and, throughput, uh, yeah. and yeah, if we talk about max IOPS and max throughput, this is if the instance that you're attaching it to supports that. So there's a set of instance uh, limits mm -hmm. as well as if you provision that amount of bandwidth or that amount of performance on that particular volume type. This is the maximum let's say the biggest GP3 volume that you can create is 16,000 IOPS and one gig. And to go along with Andy's question, the, the prices here, just to be clear, this is specific to moving data within these different tiers, right? No, actually, that's a great question. It's not moving tiers in between. This is just the raw pricing for EBS. Okay. Ah, so okay. if you provision a gigabyte for a month, it's eight cents. Okay, got it. What about ingress and egress? Is that covered? No ingress and egress. In that EBS is zonal, it's attached to an instance, and we don't, ah. you, you, there is no bandwidth charges associated with EBS. It's really you, ah. you pay okay. for 
the performance characteristic and the capacity characteristic that you want. I see. And that's different from S3 then? That is correct. Right. Okay, thank you. Yep. So if someone wants to, so someone is using EBS and uh, some kind of stateful data is being maintained on that EBS volume, now he wants to move that workload to on-premise. So will there be an egress cost for that? In that particular situation, depending on the mechanism that they use to do it, there will be an egress charge for the data transfer from that instance on-prem. It might come via Direct Connect, it might come via other things, okay. but it's actually not an EBS charge. EBS is unlimited bandwidth to that instance. If you decide to terminate a service on that instance, like a I don't know, an SCP off, right? Um, uh, you're going to be moving data from that instance into, a, into an on-prem situation, and then whichever mechanism you use to do that will have its own pricing. Are you, are you able to connect the EBS volumes to anything besides an EC2 instance, such as a PaaS offering or something like that? It's an interesting question. So you are able to create... Uh, um, uh, bridges with EBS to other environments through what we call the direct API um, uh, for snapshots. So for instance, you could take a live EBS volume, you could snapshot an EBS volume, take a full copy of all of the data that is in that volume, and you now have it as an EBS snapshot. And then you can, via web service, whether or not it is in the AWS infrastructure or you build an application to, for instance, connect it to a PaaS offering, you can then access all of the blocks that are in that snapshot. And for instance- At that point it's on S3 though. Eh, it's actually, it is in, it is in S3 uh, from a connectivity standpoint, but it's not built that way, it's not- Right, it's, it's an EBS exposed S3 kind that's of That's correct, thing. right, yeah. That's correct. So when, but it is, it is, it is automatically plumbed all of the data movement hmm. to get it into, and, and to, to turn this back into a customer conversation, Many customers will use that, for instance, for um, data analytics, ransomware stuff, things that are scanning uh, uh, particular volumes mm -hmm. uh, because they'll build an automated process that, for instance, snaps a volume in EBS and then, and then interrogates that volume via something like direct APIs. Yeah. They also use it a lot on the backup side. Yeah, sure, thanks. So, so when we take a snapshot of EBS, the data goes uh, to S3? Mm -hmm. It is correct. When you take a snapshot on EBS, uh, we either take a full or an incremental, depending on what is correct in the situation, and we store that data in S3. And as uh, we'll talk about here over the course of, uh, uh, of the day, one of the great advantages of that is, is that you can really look at those snapshots as backups as well, because they have great independence of implementation between S3 and EBS, as well as all of the geographic spread uh, and the durability of S3. So a customer can move from IO2BX to SC1 with a single API call. Single API. And then do it, do it back again with yep. a single API call. Yep. <laughs> How quickly does the data I, actually get to a point where it's operating at you know, thousand, you know, four thousand, four gigabytes per second versus two hundred fifty megabytes per second. I mean, yeah, it seems like it seems, was, seems cool. Yeah, that yeah, if I was doing something like ILM with this sort of stuff, where I was just moving, I'm doing some application that needs performance. I put it on IO two yep. BX, and the moment it doesn't need it anymore, I move it to SC one. I mean, like, I'd be doing this a thousand times a day. Does this well, make sense? We will actually talk about an actual customer use case where they store all of their data on SC one. Actually, I think it's ST1 to be exact. Um, uh, and when they see the ST1 burst credits show up in their CloudWatch metrics, they actually trigger an internal, aut completely automated process to go move it to GP, right? Because they're doing exactly that without even a human going in and doing it. Um, the, the answer is it's not instantaneous. The answer is, um, well, at a technical level, uh, it becomes the highest common denominator um, uh, 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 between the, uh, the two volume types. So let's give a real example. If you're moving from ST1 to IO1 or to IO2, um, uh, the very minute that that API call completes, all of your writes are already at IO2 speed. And that's O of you know, uh, milliseconds. It's O of seconds in, in the API call. It's O of milliseconds at the data plane level. Um, the reads, 
Well, the reads are actually on ST1 at that point, right? And so EBS will automatically start bringing all of the data from ST1 into IO2. So you get, when you're processing a volume modification like that, the right behavior of your target almost immediately, right? You get the read behavior as the system can move all of it to. So in your very dichotomous example of uh, SC1 to the fastest IO2, it's gonna depend on your workload as to whether or not that is the perfect thing to do at a fast rate or not. But uh, we absolutely see customers doing it today. So is there an intermediate state where data would be duplicated between uh, SC1 and IO2 because we are serving reads and writes? That is all behind the service veil. You don't have okay. to worry about that, right? Because I think the thing to remember is, is that what EBS's service contract is, is can I service that read? Can I service that write, right? And from a read and a write perspective, as well as our durability and our availability guarantees, we handle all of the movement underneath the covers. This is probably the wrong group to say, you don't need to worry about this. This is the cloud, man. You don't have to worry about it. You can press me. You can press me. Uh, when it's, you, take, when you cloud. take a snapshot of, uh, of an EBS volume, um, can you mount that snapshot to a, to a VM or to an EC2 instance at that point? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and do you feel that 16 TB or 64 TB is good enough uh, scale wherein the, I mean like... Yeah, 1664 TB, that, remember that is per volume, right? And uh, so we support, hmm, I'm going to have to, let's, let's take a note. Um, <laughs> we support about 27 volumes, depending on how many ENAs that you have configured on a current Nitro config. Um, and we just announced and are just releasing a much larger number uh, uh, for our next generation uh, six series uh, um, uh, uh, instances uh, in the 80-ish range. So uh, when you look at through those lens, 80 volumes at 16T or 80 volumes at 64T to a single instance, uh, it's a ton of storage. Yeah, we, I mean, we've, we're always listening to our customers' feedback, but uh, we, we have seen the vast, vast majority of customers' needs met by that. I'm sorry, what's an ENA, did you say? Oh, uh, elastic a, a elastic network adapter. Thank you. Yeah. So, oh, seems like you guys want to dive into some of the details. I would love to. Um, there were two things that I thought uh, in the time that we had that would be worthwhile kind of diving into a bit more detailed. Um, uh, and these are things that make EBS special beyond the stuff that we've already started to talk about because the transitions that we were just talking about are not something that you would do in a normal everyday infrastructure. Being able to move from one volume type to another volume type transparently online, migrate the size, the capacity, the performance, etc. Two of them that came to mind and that we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about are SRD, uh, our scalable reliable datagram service, and the built-in resiliency inside of EBS. From an SRD perspective, SRD is our bottom-up protocol stack purpose-built for AWS's data centers that supports multipathing. It supports retries on the order of microseconds instead of milliseconds, and it's completely integrated into the custom ASIC and hardware, it's not ASIC, our custom silicon uh, that we run from a Nitro perspective. Now, to understand why any of this stuff makes sense, you have to take a little bit of a detour and talk about the difference between TCP and SRD. Um, and I think we're all familiar with the way that uh, large cloud center uh, or cloud scale data centers are built out. Um, but you can imagine instead of your traditional uh, kind of tree-based topology from a router and switch perspective, we run very dense, very scaled, very interconnected networks. Why? Because we minimize the oversubscription uh, in those infrastructures. What does that result? It results in architectures from a network perspective that look a lot like these squares as opposed to trees. Now, TCP picks one path through all of those squares. And if something is wrong, we have a link flap, we have a switch failure, we have an ASIC failure, it doesn't matter, right? These are very large systems but we have thousands of paths. 
that TCP connection is A, the only pipe that you're putting all of that information through, and B, has to then go through its ability to go get reconnected and reestablished, which takes on order of milliseconds, even if you tune it down. SRD natively encompasses all of that technology and topology into trying to drive a fully multi-path out of order distribution across all the paths with dynamic path um, uh, uh, correction on order of microseconds. So when I send a big packet from the front of a SRD host to another SRD host, it gets A, split into lots of things. It gets B, delivered at the same time across all of these different paths, then C, reassembled at the end, uh, and any of the things that have failed in between are quickly retried. Um, the difference is really large when you look at the implementation impact on something like EBS. So we use SRD uh, in IO2. Um, and we use it both from the client uh, to um, the EBS infrastructure or from the instance to the EBS infrastructure as well as across the EBS infrastructure because you can imagine that EBS has to manage its own durability. So it's taking care of replication and all of the protection of the data associated with those rights. And this is a view of rights. Rights are, by the way, the longest tail in any storage infrastructure. Because when you're looking at a write, you're rolling the dice multiple times because you have to go through the most number of network links, and you have to go through the most number of stacks to provide the level of durability necessary. Because at a minimum, you can think about, I have to store two copies of the data at a minimum, right? And that means acknowledging the write from one location that it was its terminus and getting that data acknowledged in a secondary location and then returning the response. Here we see a difference in SRD versus TCP at scale on out percentiles. You can think about this as tail latency, right? Tail latency is super important because if you have anything that does head of line blocking like a database that can't progress on its transactions because it's waiting for that one IO that went slow, right? It has a very large ripple effect mm -hmm. on your application. And in SRD, because it's so resilient, to the networking infrastructure, and because it can use all of those paths in our infrastructure, we see a 90% reduction in long tail latencies with SRD. And you can see it also has a huge impact on, for instance, the throughput that we can so push start through the infrastructure. Showing EBS IO2 on, let's say, TCP mm -hmm. versus EBS IO2 on SRD, is that how I read this? That's correct. Ah. That's correct. So when we talk about multi-pathing, multi so or do we utilize multiple paths only when one path uh, messaging failed? No, nope, it's not like DMP round robin. This is it's between multiple packets or multiple paths at all times for that stream. So will it not cause more congestion in the? Nope, we actually see a decrease in the amount of congestion that we have to deal with because it's also UDP. Um, uh, so it's it's faster in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we are routing multiple packets also for the same thing. So we kind of we kind of are duplicating packets for the same. I am not doing FEC. I am not doing FEC um, uh, forward error correction, right? Um, uh, the, you, uh, SRD is taking the stream and leveraging the fact that it knows hundreds of paths across the fabric, sending all the data across all of those paths. And because it has very tight timeouts because it understands the AWS infrastructure, can retransmit those very quickly. And all of those are being reassembled for in-order delivery at the end. Just to interrupt you for a second, because you threw in nitro there, and again, I'm not new to this, I'm new to this terminology. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about nitro for anybody that's listening? Sure. Ni new? N yeah, nitro. Nitro is AWS's uh, custom uh, silicon infrastructure that allows us to provide all of the hardware abstractions without needing to do uh, kind of offloads in the VMs, et cetera. So it's the basis of all of our Nitro-based instances. Nitro allows EBS, for instance, to present what appear to be physical NVMe devices directly to the instance that are not para-virtualized or anything else. Okay. They are literally PCI, um, uh, 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 compliant like 
NVMe devices that your normal block stack latches up to. So it's not really a, a virtualization layer, no. right? It's not software defined storage, right? This is your baby. Is That's correct. Down to. Okay, got That's it. correct. Thank sort you. of like a composable architecture junction point. Yeah. So if that's SRD in implementation, what does it SRD really show up if you were to look at a customer workload? If you were to look at a customer workload, here, um, uh, uh, this is tick data, right? So very common in financial services industries, tick data processing, Stack M3 is a benchmark that uh, lots of people will uh, talk through from a uh, tick data perspective. Uh, the, the money is really at the bottom here, uh, where you look at, this is a IO2BX infrastructure, where we have a mean and a median and a uh, uh, min of, of 302 to 367 mics uh, for uh, it at scale driving a ton of IO and a standard deviation of 38 microseconds. Um, so it's <coughs> extremely tight from a, from a timing perspective as well as a P50 uh, uh, that really lets you bring these enterprise applications uh, to the cloud. I think the other side to talk about is resiliency. Um, in AWS, of course, as a cloud provider, um, the storage, the compute, the networking, the facilities are all things that we can manage uh, and that we vend services for you um, uh, that let you focus on the important things, the applications and the operating systems. That means from a managed infrastructure standpoint that there's no downtime for upgrades and patching. Um, Harkening back to what we talked about earlier from an availability standpoint, we have independent availability zones and those are also fault domains for us, right? So EBS does not share fate in, in one AZ with another AZ in the exact same region. But this goes infrastructurally deep goes to all the way that my team deploys and the way that we test and the way that we actually roll out software, et cetera. We're managing those fault domains so that we can basically vend, hey, you have two or three or 10 or 80 well-managed uh, AZs that are independent fault domains for you to be able to run your business on if you want to build a multi-AZ strategy, et cetera, which is always uh, our recommendation. Now you mentioned earlier that uh, rights are mirrored. Rights are durably protected. It depends on whether or not they're mirrored or more, depending on the type of uh, volume that you might be using. So IO2 versus GP3 mm -hmm. has different types of uh, redundancy, let's call it, data protection? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So GP2 and GP3, uh, we have a, a durability guidance of 99.8 to 99.9 .9 AFR, right? Um, uh, IO2 is a 99.999 or a 5.9's durability. So you can imagine that architecturally we make different decisions with regards to the width of the replication uh, and the infrastructure uh, as we store those. Again, that's all abstracted behind the veil. So it's primarily mirroring, it's not like erasure coding or anything like that that's going on? I didn't say that. It is both. It depends. Uh, uh, we use erasure encoding when it's appropriate. We use mirroring when it's appropriate. We use more than mirroring when it's appropriate, whether or not it's two-way or three-way. And all that's been done within a fault domain. It's all done within an AZ, that's correct. It's all done within a single AZ and we don't share the blocks outside of that AZ. Unless you're replicating. Unless you're replicating, but you're gonna replicate either by snapping in S3 and, and, and then hydrating that S3 snapshot mm -hmm. in another AZ, or you're gonna do a replication that is at, say, at the instance level, mm -hmm. right? So DRDB or something like that, directly at the instance level. You, you don't have any sort of synchronous to another, uh, I guess you're in availability zone, you're in two data centers, so yeah. yeah. Okay. No, it's, a, it's something that we've constantly worked through with customers, and it's something that's very much on our radar screen, but today we don't do synchronous replication across AZs at kind of an EBS service level been doing this long enough, right, that you probably can guess that it would be mirrored into a cache that would then be put on a racial encoded backing storage. It could be. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it depends, no, on, depends, on, right. it, depends on the solution they're talking about. That, that's, that's a would be a common way of doing it. Yep. And then if you think about the EBS built-in resiliency, um, uh, you know, we've talked about a few of these things. You can 
think about built-in resiliency, things like SRD, right? Even the notion that SRD exists and the fact that we've integrated in AWS Silicon is part of that resiliency around path and network management. But EBS also very much optimizes where we're laying out the pieces of the EBS infrastructure that are involved in your volume. We understand the topology of your instance and where we are keeping the redundant pieces of EBS infrastructure. And in fact, as we look at additional fault redundant techniques, EBS goes one step further. Not only has each one of these AZs got multiple lineups and different maintenance teams and different power feeds, EBS is actually aware of the way that that physical topology is laid out inside of our data centers and does optimizations to actually decrease fault domains and fault resilient or increase fault resilience by optimizing layout picking things that are, for instance, across power domains and those kinds of things from a layout perspective to all minimize the impact of any infrastructural failure. And this is always, of course, done through automated recovery as well. One of the cool things about EBS is, is that the control plane is really just a control plane in that once something is attached and doing IO for EBS, it's what I would call statically stable, meaning that even if that infrastructure experiences, let's say, a complete power failure and comes back up, there is no dependence on the control plane in bringing that data path back up, right? Uh, and there is also no reach out to the control plane while the data path is in active operation. So it's a very much a separation of concerns that allows the system to weather any failures as best as possible. So does, does SRB kind of use like uh, TCP? based uh, reliable delivery mechanisms on top of the UDP network? Uh, not quite. SRD doesn't use any TCP at all. Well, I, I don't, no, I, I realize it doesn't use any TCP at all, but would it use something like, uh, you know, the, um, the you know, cascading acts and whatever to, to make sure that all of the data actually gets delivered in a timely fashion? Uh, I, I think I think the best way to describe it, and, and I'd be happy to talk offline with you and point you in the direction okay. of some SRD white papers, but I think the best way is, is that it achieves those same outcomes as TCP and sometimes using similar uh, techniques, but certainly nothing that is that is shared because it is it okay. is kind of uh, from the ground up meant to be multipath versus kind of uh, single path. Okay. So question though, um, I, I understand you use an SRD to connect the, the instance, I guess the physical host running that instance to the, I guess the physical, the, the virtual instance of your EBS mm -hmm. volume, right? Mm -hmm. And you use an SRD as a network protocol, but what is the layer seven protocol connecting the instance to that storage? Is it iSCSI? Is it, what are you guys using to actually get those? That's custom as well, to, All right, to so be you, perfectly honest. All right, so you get it wrong. Um, so, so if you think about uh, the, the um, SRD infrastructure, it actually presents um, what amounts to uh, a, uh, a variation of NVMe over fabric mm -hmm. is maybe the simplest way to uh, simplify it. And that NVMe over fabric is then presented by the EBS client as an NVMe device mm -hmm. Uh, on the instance. Oh, so it looks like NVMe, okay. So if you, look at the, if you look at the semantics of that device, it's NVMe. If you look at um, uh, kind of the, uh, and if you were to look at it from a layer seven perspective, that's probably the closest analogy. Yeah, but it's nothing standard. No. Right. Is NVMe also for the hard drives that are being exposed or it is iSCSI for those ones? There is no iSCSI in this. So uh, like if, if we were talking about iSCSI, we would be probably talking about iSCSI delivered to the instance where an OS was saying, hey, I am an iSCSI initiator. I am connecting to an iSCSI target and EBS would be providing that iSCSI target. That's not the EBS model. The EBS model is presenting you a physical hardware device that understands NVMe. I was asking, the, I was answering the gentleman's question is, Behind the covers, right, that physical NVMe device actually speaks with my, my EBS infrastructure with something that is akin to NVMe over fabric, right, from a layer seven perspective. Is that regardless of any type of media in the back end, even if it's like a, a, one of the slow cold archive exactly layers, correct. it's still that gonna be correct. NVMe looking to your, I oh, got it. That is correct. Okay, um, interesting. 
In addition to the resiliency conversations, we've also tried to continually raise the bar with regards to how we let our customers test. For instance, I talked about the multi-AZ conversation. So let's say you've built a great multi-AZ application. You have stuff in one AZ and you want to test whether or not your alerts, CloudWatch metrics, and everything else respond to an outage in one AZ and, and automatically seamlessly fail over to another. Uh, we just released uh, the beginning of this year integration with FIS that allows you to do that by simulating EBS impairment uh, for those volumes. But very quickly, I want to pull it all together. We'll talk about a couple of customer examples because we talked about that lift and shift, about the modernize, and about the optimize. And from a migration perspective, Nissan is a really cool example. Right, this was a lift and shift of an SAP infrastructure used for their new car generation data and financial uh, 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 systems and analysis systems for uh, uh, their production lines. They improved their performance because they were able to kind of right size the performance uh, of the storage to the instances that they needed. But interestingly, they used the multi-AZ stuff that I was talking about to run this database in multiple locations, and they dramatically improved their RPO and their RTO with regards to database recovery. Another example from a modernization standpoint is Experian, an FSI company I think we're all familiar with. They took it one step further. They used a whole bunch of managed services during their evolution to the cloud, um, uh, moving to using MSK, Right, uh, using uh, Redshift, uh, using RDS. By the way, all three infrastructural managed services that use EBS in some capacity underneath the covers in the purposes of providing those managed services on AWS. Experian using that as well as native AWS uh, EC2 and, and EBS storage um, is working over a three petabyte uh, data store and they've gotten with the snapshot functionality that we talked about, the ability to restore in minutes, and they've dropped the speed with which they can turn new products and Experian down from years to like a quarter, which is like super cool. And another example, Devo is a logging and security analytics cloud native company. So it doesn't just, it's not just companies that move to the cloud. Some companies that are born in the cloud are also part of this evolution. Um, and, and in Devo's case, as, they, as we provided things like GP3 to decrease costs, um, uh, they moved without any interruption and no downtime from GP2 to GP3, saving 20%. And Devo is actually one of the examples that, uh, talking to your point, where they dynamically moved from ST1 uh, to uh, GP um, based on their workloads and the time of day and those kinds of things to manage their costs. Uh, and that has saved them operationally a ton of time as well. So it gives you a little bit of grounding in terms of, hey, those are the technologies. That's the EBS infrastructure. How is it actually solving customers' problems? Uh